The date was August 17, 1943. The air over Dolbadora Airfield, New Guinea, was thick, a smothering blanket of jungle heat and diesel fumes. At 0742 AM, Technical Sergeant James McKenna, 25 years old and perpetually exhausted, wiped sweat from his brow. His eyes, usually sharp and focused on maintenance logs, were fixed on the silhouette of a P-38 Lightning. Crouched beneath the aluminum wing, he watched the pilot, Lieutenant Robert Hayes, climb into the cockpit. Hayes, a young man from the flatlands of Iowa, carried the weight of zero kills in the chilling. Awareness that he was headed into a swarm of 18 elite. Japanese Zero Fighters. McKenna had a nearly spiritual connection with the P-38. He admired its power, the high-speed dive, the devastating firepower from its nose-mounted guns, but he felt the shame of its fatal weakness. He knew the P-38's limitations weren't just aerodynamic. They were mechanical. The American doctrine, constantly preached by instructors, was sound on paper. Speed and altitude were survival. Yet combat was fluid and unforgiving. The Japanese, sensing the P-38's sluggishness, had perfected a counter-tactic. They'd use calculated maneuvers to force a turning engagement, where the P-38 was mathematically doomed. McKenna had seen the results firsthand. 37 Lightnings lost in six weeks. The engineering manuals and instructors spoke of pilot error, a bureaucratic convenience that ignored the grim reality. McKenna's hands, which knew the tension of every bolt and cable, knew better. The aileron control cables, long and complex, running through the booms, had a factory-mandated tolerance, a fractional amount of slack, approximately three-eighths of an inch. This slack, though officially acceptable, created a noticeable, deadly delay in control response during low-speed, high-G maneuvers. It was a minuscule flaw, a detail too small for generals, but large enough to kill the men who flew. The maintenance manuals forbade any unauthorized field modification. Lockheed, the only authority that could sanction a fix, was a world away. McKenna felt a crushing sense of powerlessness. Signing off on aircraft he knew were fundamentally compromised, the hangar bay felt like a morgue to McKenna. Every lost pilot was a ghost chained to a technical specification. He remembered Lieutenant David Chen, lost in July, talking about his near-death experience. Chen's exact words echoed in McKenna's mind. It felt like I was fighting the airplane, Sergeant. Like trying to roll through mud. When Chen was later killed, flying a different, yet identical P-38, McKenna's suspicion solidified into certainty. Then came Captain William Morrison, a respected veteran who should have known how to survive. Morrison's final moments, relayed by his wingman, described a frantic struggle. Control's mushy. It's not answering! Morrison attempted an emergency split S, but the Zeros stayed with him. Their timing perfect, their aim true. Rodriguez, Morrison's heartbroken crew chief, meticulously checked every setting on the recovered wreck. Fuel rigging, engine timing, all within specs. They stood together in the hangar, two mechanics staring at a dead man's perfect machine, united by the knowledge that the specs themselves were the killer. By mid-August, the constant casualties had eroded the squadron's morale. Pilots returned, faces pale, reporting the same vague, unsettling sensation. Lag in the controls. Most accepted it as an unavoidable characteristic of the heavy fighter. But McKenna knew the source, that tiny, audible twang when he plucked the cables, the sound of authorized slack. He and Rodriguez often discussed the problem in hushed tones. The forbidden topic, unapproved modifications. They knew the risk, prison time, a court-martial, but they also knew the cost of inaction. Hayes, with his six fruitless missions, represented the desperate end of the line. He wasn't a bad pilot. He was a pilot who followed the rules and nearly died five times for it. He'd seen his friend. Parker, scream into the radio as the Zeros closed in, a young life extinguished by a technical footnote. That night, August 16th, as Hayes stood before McKenna, his voice shaking with a controlled terror, he offered a silent challenge, save me from the manual. McKenna looked into the young pilot's eyes and saw not a risk to his career, but a chance to finally defy the deadly regulations. The hangar, usually bustling, was silent under the dim bare bulbs after 2,300 hours.
McKenna worked alone, the only sounds the metallic. Click of his tools and the occasional whine of a distant mosquito. The air was heavy, almost suffocating. He removed the inspection panel from the P-38's left boom, feeling the slight warmth still radiating from the metal. He reached inside and grasped the aileron cable. Pulling it gently, he confirmed the enemy. Three-eighths of an inch of play before the resistance kicked in. That three-eighths of an inch was the length of a pilot's life. His surgical tool was a six-inch section of piano wire, high tensile steel filched from the wreckage of a scrapped rudder trim system. It was rigid and unforgiving. He took his pliers and began the difficult, precise work of bending the wire into a perfect Z shape. The first two attempts were failures. On the third attempt, the pliers slipped, leaving a stinging cut on his thumb. He ignored the blood, wiping his hand on his oil-soaked coveralls. The Z shape was designed to be an inline, non-standard turnbuckle, adding a precise amount of tension to the cable to take up the slack without over-tensioning the system. Installing the tensioner in the tight confines of the boom was agonizing. Working by the bobbing beam of a flashlight, McKenna's knuckles scraped against the metal structure. He fought the small space, his heart pounding so loudly he thought it would wake the guards. When the clevis pin, a critical piece, slipped from his greasy fingers and vanished into the darkness of the boom's interior, a wave of despair washed over him. He spent five tense minutes blindly fishing for the small piece of metal, a moment of acute helplessness. Retrieving it, he forced the cable back into position, inserting the Z tensioner. The fit was so tight he had to use a cheater bar to align the clevis pinhole. The moment the pin seated, he tested the cable. He pulled, zero slack. The cable was taut, ringing with a clean high note when he plucked it. A quick check in the cockpit confirmed it. The stick moved. The aileron moved, instantly, simultaneously. He sealed the inspection panel, wiped every speck of oil and blood, and left the hangar at Dewan One Fieve. Had violated a dozen military codes and risked his freedom. But for the first time in months, he felt a flicker of hope for the sunrise. The tension on the airfield the next morning was suffocating. As Hayes taxied out at 0742, McKenna watched, his gut churning. He had traded a potential court-martial for the possibility of saving a life. The engagement began 32 minutes. Later, at 814 over the Huan Gulf, Hayes dove from altitude. When the Zero pilot expertly snap-rolled to evade, Hayes rolled with him, anticipating the usual lag. But this time there was none. The P-38, responding with a newfound ferocity, obeyed the stick command immediately. Hayes felt an electrifying connection with the machine. He rolled 90 degrees faster than ever before. The Zero, expecting to emerge outside the P-38's attack cone, was caught perfectly in the sight. Hayes squeezed the trigger. A direct hit. The Zero fell away, smoking. Hayes's first kill. But the real test came seconds later when three more Zeros dove for revenge. Abandoning the suicidal doctrine of running, Hayes executed a radical reversal. He rolled and pulled hard. The P-38 snapped around instantly its nose coming through the horizon in a move that should have been impossible. The lead zero, timing its entry based on the P-38's known sluggishness, overshot dangerously. Hayes pressed the attack, closing the gap. Boom! A second zero exploded. The remaining two tried their intricate scissor maneuvers. But Hayes stayed with them, his lightning reacting with the agility of a light fighter. He slipped inside the final zero's turn and destroyed it at point-blank range. Three kills in seven minutes. When Hayes landed at 0903, the squadron was buzzing. Hayes emerged from the cockpit, his face smeared with sweat and oil, but alive. He walked directly to McKenna, his voice thick with emotion, and simply said, She answered, Sergeant. She finally answered. Captain Frank Mitchell, an ace in the 475th, had witnessed the whole fight. He demanded to know what was different. McKenna confessed the unauthorized modification. Mitchell, having lost too many men, didn't hesitate. I don't care what the manual says. Do it to my bird, now. The McKenna fix became the Pacific's greatest unwritten rule. Mechanics secretly taught each other the Zed bend. Pilots spoke of the responsive lightnings in hushed, excited tones. The maintenance logs remained pristine. The tensioners temporarily removed before any official check. The results were irrefutable. The P-38 kill ratio skyrocketed, eventually surpassing the zeros. 
Japanese intelligence was baffled. Their pilots, including the legendary Saburo Sakai, reported that American P-38s were maneuvering. Unnaturally fast, they searched wreckage, found nothing, and concluded the Americans had a new secret weapon they never realized. The war had been turned by a small, bent piece of piano wire, an act of defiance by a mechanic who chose to save lives over following specifications. The official report on the change in combat effectiveness finally arrived in Washington in October. 1943, report that debated a regulation-breaking modification while the pilots it had saved were busy winning the war.